let me tell you about my family. My father, Walter Owen, was a skilled carpenter who ran his business in the city of Oxford. He was a devout and loyal Catholic at a time when Christ's religion was fiercely persecuted in England by the Elizabethan government. My brothers, John and Walter, responded to our Saviour's call to the priesthood. They became priests of the English mission, risking their very lives to bring the sacraments and the holy sacrifice of the Mass to the English Catholics. My brother Henry was a clandestine printer of Catholic literature in Northamptonshire. How the circulation of these works of truth infuriated the enemies of Christ and nourished the souls of his people. As for me, I chose to follow the trade of my father and that of our Lord Jesus, and I became a carpenter. It was in this trade that Jesus was able to use my humble gifts to assist the workers of his vineyard. Our Lord Jesus Christ instilled in my heart a deep devotion to the Catholic priesthood. I knew that without the priesthood there would be no Mass, no Jesus truly present in the Eucharist, and no confession. And so I sought to serve these men who were daily hunted under the constant threat of death. With the skill of my hands, my small stature, and my complete trust, I became the maker of priest holes, the hidden holes tunnels and rooms that I constructed were to save so many of Christ's ministers. It was to be my life's mission. Life for a Catholic in Elizabethan England was one of intense tribulation. According to the laws of Queen Elizabeth and her government, it was a crime not to attend the state church services. It was against the law to attend the Catholic Mass, to receive the sacraments, and to be a Catholic priest. It was illegal to even shelter a priest. All of these so-called crimes were accompanied by severe penalties including death. Naturally, the Catholic priests that entered England were hunted, tortured, hanged, drawn and quartered, and Catholicism in England was violently oppressed. Therefore, how it brought joy to my heart to be able to construct hiding holes in the homes of Catholic houses throughout the whole of England so as to conceal these Catholic priests. I became friend and servant to the Jesuit priests that returned to England, and within time I was professed one of the first Jesuit lay brothers. My life as a maker of priest holes was one of secretiveness and planning. By day, I would arrive at a mansion or a house laden with monoches, pegs, hammers and wood and begin ordinary maintenance work upon the building so as not to arouse suspicion. And then, come nightfall, my real mission would begin, that of constructing the priest holes.
Before beginning my work, I would kneel down for a time of silent prayer. Sometimes the plan for the priest hole or hiding place would come before my mind's eye during my prayer. With what ingenuity our Lord used my hands to create these hiding places for his servants, as each had its own purpose and mission. Some of the holes had to be severely cramped. Some were small rooms with furniture and food provisions. And some had additional passages to other rooms. Sometimes our Lord led me to conduct a series of holes connected by a network of passages. How I smiled when I made double holes, where the first hole had a secret entrance for a second, so as to deter the hunters of priests. Uh, these priest hunters were fierce and determined men. Often, groups of them would take up residence in a suspected Catholic home for weeks. They would search rooms, tearing up floorboards, knocking down walls, banging ceilings, walls and stairs with their great staffs, listening for hollow spaces. If they found a priest, the whole household was prosecuted. If no priest was discovered, the Catholic residents had to pay large sums of money for the wages of those who had searched and wrecked the house uninvited. It was vital that the entrances to the priest holds were solid and perfectly concealed, and that as few people knew of them as possible. And so I worked alone whenever I was called. At one occasion, I bricked up half a chimney, allowing for the fire to be lit in front, and a priest to be concealed safely in the hidden space behind. Another time, I redesigned a whole drainage system so that I could use a large sewer in which no less than 10 men could hide. I never made any priest hole the same so that those discovered would not leave any clues as to what to look for when seeking the others. The government and priest hunters learned that these holes existed, but they had no idea who was carrying out the work or how many had been constructed. On several occasions, I was arrested due to my association with priests. I was tortured and hung up painfully by my wrists, but our Lord set a seal upon my lips and those that had detained me never knew my real mission or my vast knowledge about England's entire Catholic network. Many times, in order to work more effectively, I used aliases. And because of my small stature, I was often known as Little John. Our Lord always protected his Little John. For on one occasion, as I travelled alone, I fell from my horse and I broke my leg. I was found and helped by strangers who took me to an inn. These kind souls set the broken leg, never asking questions as to who I was or why I was in the area. And so, once recovered, I was able to continue my mission. The priests, whose lives I worked hard to try to save, became my great mentors and friends. How blessed I was to be the personal servant for a time of the great Catholic Jesuit priest and martyr, Father Edmund Campion. Father Edmund Campion hid in many of the priest holes up and down England. 
but to my dismay, he was eventually captured at Lyford Grange. Upon his condemnation to death for treason, I did not hold back in my declaration of his innocence, which led once more to my own arrest. But I was deemed a person of small account and was shortly released. Father Edmund Campion, however, was martyred for the Catholic faith and the priesthood. He was hung, drawn and quartered at Tyburn, and many times thereafter I invoked his assistance as I continued my own mission for the Catholic faith in England. Most of my own work took place under the direction and companionship of Father Henry Garnet, the Jesuit superior in England. I would accompany this brave priest on his rounds throughout England, setting up mass centres, teaching recusant Catholics, carrying out maintenance on previous priest holes. I was also privileged to be able to assist the great Jesuit missionary priest, Father John Gerard. I helped this tireless priest to find and rent out safe houses and to plan missions to the Christian faithful in England. Father John Gerard was fiercely hunted by the government. He would often hide in my priest holes and on one occasion was concealed for several weeks at an important Catholic home called Braddock's. It was an extremely tense moment when the priest hunters lit a fire on the hearth beneath which Father Gerard was concealed. When Father Gerard was captured and held in the Tower of London, I carefully planned his famous escape. Once he had escaped out of the prison, two servants rode him down the River Thames, where I awaited with horses, and we galloped off into the country. Upon the accession to the throne of England of a new English monarch, King James I, things became even tenser and more dangerous. The English people grew impatient and despairing over the king's empty promises to lift the cruel laws in place in England against the English Catholics. Sir Robert Cecil, the king's minister and chief spymaster, was soon delighted to learn of the plans of a group of young Catholic men who recklessly decided to take matters into their own hands and destroy the government once and for all. These young Catholic men spoke together of plans and ideas to end the reign of tyranny upon the Catholic people of England by secretly placing gunpowder kegs beneath the parliament buildings and thus murdering the government and the king. Despite warnings and advice from Jesuit priests and Catholics not to proceed with their violent intentions, the young plotters, knowing for certain that new laws were going to be passed against Catholics that would be more bitter and grievous than the last, and seeing how they were to be scourged, not with whips, but by scorpions, thought that there was no human hope left unless they chose to help themselves. Sir Cecil watched, encouraged, manipulated and incited these young men in the soon to be famous gunpowder plot. For the King's spymaster saw it as a great opportunity to incite final outrage upon the Catholic people he so despised and destroy Catholicism in England for good. Just as the barrels of gunpowder were about to be lit beneath the Parliament buildings, Sir Cecil captured Guy Fawkes, the leader of the group, and the reckless plot was made known. Sir Cecil planned work perfectly, 
for now he was able to use the gunpowder plot to hunt out and murder the Jesuits, who were friends of the Catholic men involved and were the main cause of trouble and fury to the anti-Catholic government. On the 5th of November in 1605, upon learning of the plot and the subsequent assault upon the English Catholics, Father Garnet and I took refuge in Hindlip Hall, where I had constructed over 13 hiding places over the years. These included secret stairs, chimney breasts with false flues, trapdoors and rooms. We were soon joined by Father Edward Oldcorn and Brother Ralph Ashley, the latter of whom was a Jesuit lay brother like me. We remained at Hendlip Hall, speaking, praying and hiding together as the storm in England against Catholicism raged. Two months later, in January 1606, warrants were issued for the arrest of the Jesuit priests Before long, a large group of hunters headed by the Justice of the Peace arrived at the hall where we and Jesuit priests were hiding. Brother Ralph and I quickly climbed into a small hole and the Jesuit priests concealed themselves within another elsewhere in the house. The hunters began their search and Brother Ralph and I, hidden together, survived on one apple between us for many days. My heart was heavy and troubled with fear at the thought of the priests being found. It was decided between Brother Ralph and I, after a much whispered prayer and discussion, that we would give ourselves up in the hope of deferring the hunt for the priests. Brother Ralph and I emerged from our place of hiding and were immediately captured. We pretended to be the hunted priests and the authorities rejoiced. But our ruse did not deceive them for long. And after 12 days of continued hunting, the Jesuit priests were found and arrested. After a while, we were all bound and taken to London. Uh, my heart was filled with a strange joy, for my mission had run its course, and now I knew that Jesus was asking me for the sacrifice of my life for his persecuted church. I eagerly desired to suffer in union with the sufferings of our Saviour, and so united my impending tortures to those of Christ's. I was first taken to Marshalsea and imprisoned. It was hoped that my priest friends might contact me there and that I would reveal information to my captors, but I used the time for silence and prayer. Shortly thereafter, I was moved to the Tower of London. Once at the Tower of London, I learned that the authorities now realised who I was. Sir Robert Cecil was triumphant when he understood that they had captured the maker of priest holes. The government now understood the wealth of information that I contained, and that should they be able to break me, they would be able to bring down the entire network of Catholics in England, and perhaps destroy Catholicism in England for good. So, in the Tower of London, I was relentlessly tortured. Oh, 
how my flesh screamed as these men vented their hatred for Christ and his church upon me. But all I uttered were the holy names of Jesus and Mary. Hour after hour, day after day, I was tortured. There seemed to be no more passage of time, but a dark and violent suspended nightmare of pain and horror. I was racked over and over, and then an excruciating old wound I had suffered many years before from a ruptured organ was soon discovered by my tormentors. With this injury I should have been exempt from torture under law, but praised be Jesus, I was permitted the glory of further suffering for Catholics and for England. The tormentors devised an iron plate and strapped it to me, causing me indescribable, unyielding pain. But it allowed for them to continue their work upon me without endangering my life. So they thought. They hung me up by iron gauntlets. And when I still refused to reveal their coveted information, Weights were added to my feet. I did not even breathe the name of a priest to these enemies of Christ's church, and how they raged with fury. I knew that I would not hold out for long, that Jesus was calling my soul to his. Eternity soon approached, and the short years of my life played swiftly before me. My heart was filled with joy, and my eyes then turned towards Jesus. After many days of torture, it was there, in the deepest, darkest regions of that infamous prison in the Tower of London, that my very life poured out in sacrifice for the Catholic Church in England. Tortured to death, a faithful Catholic to the end, I commended my very being unto the hands of Jesus, and the soul of little John took flight to his God.